All right, well, let's let's go ahead and dive in. So I'm just gonna share my screen for a moment. Um, nope, not that. Let's see here. All right, so what I wanna do is get rid of that. And here we are. Okay, now I'm gonna go back to sharing my screen. So first of all, I just wanna say welcome to everybody. And let's go ahead and, uh, okay. So I wanna start with uh, today with a quote from Pirkei Avot from the Mishnah, uh, from uh, the first part of our uh, Jewish law. Rabbi Eliezer would say, prepare for your death one day before your death. His disciples asked, does a person know on which day they will die? Said he to them, this being the case, you should prepare today for perhaps tomorrow you will die. <laughs> now, I, I, it's a morbid way to jump in, I know. Um, but, you know, our rabbis were not, um, they did not tiptoe on eggshells. They were really sort of honest about um, what they did and didn't know. So we get all sorts of pontification around what the afterlife could entail. And I say could with a capital C because they didn't know. And they, um, there was a lot of conjecture. And Rabbi Kolik and I just spent six hours teaching about all sorts of different um, uh, options and um, ponderings on the afterlife. And that's not what we're going to do here today. But so while the rabbis didn't know what necessarily came next, they did know that this experience we're having now had a finite conclusion, that that mortality was 100% guaranteed for every single one of us. And because of that, because they didn't know what necessarily came next, they spent a lot of focus, and Judaism focuses a great deal on, so what are we doing in this moment, in this life? And really the fact that we spend so much of our focus as jews thinking about how to maximize our um, awareness and elevate our sacredness in every moment of this life um, as well as how do we leave this world in a better place than when we first came to it it it's not surprising that we would spend an equal amount of energy and effort thinking about what does it mean for us when it gets time to depart this life? Why should that get receive any less attention or any less care? And that's really what we're gonna spend some time doing here today is thinking about that time of our life, which to Rabbi Eliezer's point could be today. I, I hope to God that it's not, um, but it, it could be and Judaism is just honest and frank about that and doesn't really kind of sugarcoat that in every moment there should be this sense of gratitude and preparedness about um, not in a morbid way, but just in an attentive and elevated awareness way. All of the commandments serve to elevate our awareness. This, this conversation is really no different. So let me take us to, um, I just have two slides to share with you. Two more. All right. So this is from Rabbi Dina London, and she says, it is important to realize that there is no date with destiny. Destiny doesn't just appear on our calendar waiting for us at the nearest Starbucks. Destiny equals the creative response to the impermanence of life. Destiny is not necessarily something that is unknown to us and will one day be revealed and it'll show up on our calendar and that'll be the day where we come to learn what it is. Destiny is in fact how it is that we respond to, approach, treat the nature, the, the, the fact that this life ends at some point. And so what do we want that to look like? How do we want to approach that moment? And what will be our attitude um, towards that? And, and again, that's part of what we're going to be talking about today. <clears throat> and lastly, because I do like to end with a little humor, especially given the topic. This is from Max Brooks, who wrote the Zombie Survival Guide complete protection from the living dead. If you believe you can accomplish everything by cramming at the 11th hour, by all means, do not lift a finger now. But you may think twice about beginning to build your ark once it has already started raining. 
a little Parshat Noah, Noah's Ark humor here. Um, so yes, we could just delay this kind of conversation, not ever have it, forget about ethical wills and advance directives and, and funeral preparations and all sorts of things because it's just too uncomfortable to think about. Or we could be creative in our approach to our destiny um, and embrace the impermanence of life and perhaps allow it to um, enhance the way we live every moment of the life that we're in and still have. So with that being said, I would like to introduce my two um, co-facilitators today. You all know Celia Lurch, our executive director, and she'll um, share a few things uh, a little bit later on in our program this morning. But I'd also like to um, introduce Marcello Salzo. Uh, Marcello is the community relationship manager here in Nashville at Alive Hospice. And I'll let him tell you a little bit more about what he does and then jump into um, our content this morning. But I can't say enough about Alive Hospice as being an incredible pillar of our Nashville and Middle Tennessee community. Um, oftentimes when we hear the word hospice, we think last breath, and that is only a small, small percentage of where hospice comes into play. Hospice is an incredible resource for us as we manage everything surrounding the fact that this life doesn't last forever. Um, and whether that's for ourselves or for our loved ones and how we manage that experience, which can sometimes be harder than managing our own. So Marcello, take it away. Yeah. Um, good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> As uh, Rabbi Lori indicated, my name is Marcello Scalzo, and I have the pleasure uh, of being the community relationship manager for Alive. And I just want to say uh, thank you to Rabbi Lori for the invitation today. Part of my role uh, as being the community relationship manager is to connect with Middle Tennessee, um, to make Nashville more resilient by informing and socializing uh, our community of these resources. Oftentimes, to Rabbi Lori's point, when people think of a live hospice, and we talked a little bit about this before y'all jumped on, we were the first hospice provider in Tennessee and third in the nation. So we've, we've been around just a little bit. And when you hear the word alive hospice, what first comes to mind for most people is that's the best place to receive end of life care when someone has a life threatening illness. And also, I just want to talk very briefly about hospice um, because <clears throat> When you throw out the terminology hospice or the word hospice care, immediately people are like, oh, it's about death and dying. And so we need to reimagine what hospice truly is. It's about caring for living people with a life-threatening illness in a very compassionate and loving way, uh, helping them get their affairs in order, relieving the stress and the illness of the pain, providing emotional and spiritual support. That's what it's truly about. Our healthcare providers, when they are navigating with that individual, the end of life care scenario, it's not about what the healthcare providers want. It's about what the patient wants. We want to empower them. What does this journey look like for you? And, and I appreciate uh, Rabbi Lori about how do you want them, how do you want to make this a better place? Or we're going to talk about that. Meaning, what are you going to give back to your family and your community when you leave? What's the footprint? What does what does your legacy truly look like? Um, also, when someone elects a hospice benefit, what comes into mind, like, oh my goodness, I heard Marcello Scalzo just brought on hospice service. He only has weeks or days to live. That's not true. Um, someone that elects the hospice benefit can enjoy the services of hospice and all that it provides for months and even longer. So I just kind of wanted to open it up with that. And we're going to talk today, as, Ra as Rabbi Lori indicated, about Alive's advanced care directives and that we offer. So I just want to, I want to make this really engaging and conversational, if you guys don't mind. Um, can, can someone share with me what their understanding of what an advanced care directive is? Anybody want to share? Uh, oh, go ahead. Well, it's, it's basically an end of life directive. Uh, and putting a, a loved one or a, someone who is near and dear to you, uh, who is able to make decisions in case you are unable to make decisions regarding your uh, end of life and uh, what uh, what's going to be done for you and what is not going to be done for you, which is even more important. 
uh, so that uh, as the slide, as the original slide showed, you don't end up doing this uh, the last day when someone is terribly sick and pandemonium ensues. The idea is to plan this out beforehand and decide whether or not you want to be intubated, whether you want a tube in you if you can't breathe, whether you want feeding, and eat, etc. And the, the directive is extremely important. And because from I'm a retired physician, for those of you who don't know me. I knew it. <laughs> I knew it. Go ahead. Go. You're, I'm going to let you go ahead and present. I love it. Go ahead, Mr. Smith. Well, without, without an advanced directive, basically, the physician's hands are like this, completely tied up. And uh, with the advanced directive, the physician has directions to where to go, what to do for this individual who is at end of life. Uh, I, I'm not going to talk about uh, hosp a live hospice because I love a live hospice. And whatever you say, Marcelo, is going to be understating what it provides to patients. Whatever you say, you can't yeah. imagine, unless you've had a patient under hospice care, unless you've had a family member under hospice care, how powerful and important it can be for end of life care. But Bob, can I, can I add to what you're saying? Because beyond, you said the doctor's hands are tied like this. I've just seen family members struggle with making such difficult decisions because they weren't already pre-made by the patient. And the, the discord and tension and sometimes fighting and anger that can occur that takes place between family members when they don't agree on a path of care. Um, and to put your family in that position to have to engage in that, I mean, it's it's hard enough as it is to, to, to go through that time, but then to have to make those decisions and not know is also so painful for a family. Yeah, yeah you shouldn't minimize what you just said. It drives fa families completely apart. Totally, completely apart. I've seen it. And the larger yeah. the family, the more susceptible that family will be to being driven completely apart without some directive. Al, did you have your hand up? And then yeah, is, isn't there, isn't this where your living will or your durable power of attorney come into play? That the person with you can now make decisions for you when you reach that position, your next position? Al, let's let Marcello answer that question about the difference mm -hmm. between living wills and advanced directives, but I want to make sure Janet gets her question on the floor too, and then Marcello, maybe you can bring them all together. Go ahead, Janet. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, my, mine's not so much a, a question as a, um, I guess, a statement. Not only living, uh, a living will, but also healthcare power of attorney, because you need to appoint an individual who can make those decisions for you. And I think one thing that, unfortunately, I've learned in the course of dealing with death and dying of family members and close friends, one of whom I not too long ago had took to live hospice, is that, um, that, that these decisions really need to be in writing and ideally they need to be notarized. Yes. And also durable power of attorney ends when the person takes their last breath. So once that happens, you really need to think beyond the person being deceased and who's going to handle those financial pair, uh, affairs with your executor. Because the person who is durable, a power of attorney, cannot sign a check after that person has died or make any financial decisions. So there's a lot involved beyond just the healthcare issues that some of which I've learned the hard way and I won't go into any further detail. No, so I, and I, I'm saying this with all sincerity and, and with all honesty. This is the first group that I've had a conversation with that I've just been blown away by your knowledge. I mean, so I applaud everybody on here for um, just having a lot of information about what advanced care directive. And that's why I'm smiling the whole time. It makes me happy to hear this. Um, 
just real quick, and then I'm going to get back to the answering the question. How many on the on the call? How many of us have an advanced care directive in place, specifically around your health care wishes? Okay, great. And then, so even though that we have our advanced care directives in place, this is also a great time for us to go back to review those um, choices just to make sure something hasn't changed. And I'm going to tell you a real life story uh, that happened to my family about advanced care planning that's in place, but then at the last minute, there was a game changer and we were caught off guard. So uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Smith and Janet for uh, just collaborating. And this is, uh, I love it when people uh, speak up and engage. So an advanced care directive simply put, and it's been said already, it's a legal document that reflects a person's wishes for future medical care in the event that they are unable to. And Janet, well said, it designates a trusted person to make decisions on his or her behalf in the event they can't. Now, a will is a type of advanced care directive, but it also includes information about minors, if there are any, about one's assets regarding their estate and how that's gonna be disseminated. So the will is all encompassing, but an advanced care directive, sometimes people will have a will completed and, but they didn't do the advanced care planning, meaning the uh, future medical care wishes. And I got a story about that as well. So uh, yes, uh, I hope that answers your questions on, on the difference. And, and, and guys, this is, it can be a difficult um, conversation. I, I love when Ra uh, Rabbi Lori and I were talking this morning and she was making some jokes. This, I know it, it depends on who you're talking with, but it should be more of a lighthearted conversation because like I told Rabbi Lori, I'm not aware of anybody not, you know, we're all going to pass away and unless I don't know something that's out there, right? It's a process and it's part of our human being journey that we're all going to die. So let's make sure that we're leaving the legacy, right? That we want to leave behind, not second guessing or wishing uh, about what those wishes uh, should be and could be. Um, so really, again, just to uh, recap, an advanced care directive is a way that we can speak up for what we want when we are unable to speak for ourselves. You are seeing this correctly. Uh, <laughs> you see a passport and you see a suitcase and a tropical island that I would love to be on. I don't think we see it, Martel. Oh, I don't think you're sharing yet. Sorry, thank you. Okay. Nope, cool, thanks for the catch. I was like, wow, I really need to see a tropical island. <laughs> Sounds great. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not seeing it. All right, y'all see it? Yes. Great. Okay. So now I want everybody on the phone in the next 15 seconds to think about if money and time was not a barrier, where would you go on vacation? Again, money wasn't an object. You could go as long as you want. Where would you go for vacation? So easy. <laughs> I've got mine. Mine's off the top of my head. So while y'all were thinking, Rabbi Lori, where, where are you going? Well, I know I'm going to the same place I think Celia is going, and that's the island of Hawaii. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. Now, so Cecilia and Rabbi Lori, we just can't get on a plane. What's got to take place before we get on that plane? What's got to happen? There's some things that, that are involved. Talk to me about that. We need to uh, check the prices. We need to buy a ticket. Make sure we have our ID. We need to pack a suitcase. Okay. Um tell our family or invite them, either one. Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, we need to make sure we have a place to stay. Okay, perfect. Um, let me ask Nanette, did I say that right? That's correct. Where would y'all go on this amazing vacation? I think I'd go back to Iceland. Oh, okay, nice. And then there, there's some planning that goes into that, right? Okay. Yeah, um, I'd have to get on Amazon immediately and get some more clothes because it's con <laughs> the weather is very dicey there. And right. um, like um, Celia said, you know, the same type of things would have to be um, planned, except I'd have to plan for the weather. I'd have to do a lot of um, checking on because it does change, you know, considerably. Awesome. Thank you for uh, participating. I uh, appreciate all three of y'all um, telling me where you would like to go. So why did I ask that? There's a point to this. Within less than a couple of minutes, 
we pretty much high level planned out what we needed to have done before we went on this trip, right? Got the passport, maybe you're going out of the country. What's the cost? Your, your gear, if it's cold, how are you going to dress? We plan for babies. We plan for parties, for great vacations. Why don't we plan for advanced care planning? Just like a great vacation, it's about providing good memories and experience when we transition. Why not? We need to celebrate our lives. And, and I, I view this as I want my family, my kids, to celebrate my life when I die. I know there's going to be mourning and sadness. That's part of the process. But I want them to remember the good memories. And this is where a live hospice comes into place. We have what's called the GIFT initiative. It's an advanced care planning. And we're going to get into this a little bit. It's about, and we call it the GIFT initiative because you are providing the gift of the conversation. You love that individual so much, you're gonna sit down and have a conversation with them about what your future medical care wishes are. Everybody needs one. Less than 50% of the American population, have, they have not completed one. Even, we, we need to go back as far as 18 years and up, need to have a completed advanced care directive. So I want you to think about something because I, I get asked that a lot. Hey, how, you know, so it's so many in their 20s. Absolutely. So being considered adult at 18, um, think about just parenting. When, when you get married and you have children, there's always going to be a little bit of difference in person's views on how to parent. What about that end of life care scenario? If you have a 19 year old and you have the parents there, are we sure that they're going to be in alignment? Do we, um, as, um, Bob indicated, do you, do you put them on life support? Uh, do you put them on a ventilator? There may be some conflict there, right? So it's important for anybody 18 years or older to uh, have an advanced care directive in place. The GIFT initiative provides, as I mentioned, the gift of the conversation to discuss your values, your personal preferences, and your, lift, and your end of life care wishes. Basically, we need to view it as this. We go on trips. Across the country, maybe in the US, we have a roadmap or GPS today, right? It's a roadmap for your future medical care wishes. And it protects your family. Uh, I think someone mentioned um, about the stress and the burden of not knowing. So it eliminates all that. And, and, and the second guessing of what those individuals, meaning that individual, what are their values? What are their personal preferences? Their end of life medical care wishes. It, it removes all of that from the family and allows them to focus and to come together and spend that quality of time that is so needed. I want to talk to you all about, I'm going to share with you guys. I hope you don't mind. Um, 2020, I know it was crazy for everybody, but for me, it was a little bit over the top. I lost um, and I'm sharing this story because I want people to know that they're not the, the only ones navigating um, losing loved ones. And I hope it provides encouragement and support because if you've lost somebody, hey, I'm not the only one, right? There's other people that are around that are in the same situation. I lost three family members within six months in 2020. And then I lost a friend to breast cancer within that same time period. And it was, uh, it was a pretty good blow to me. And one of those individuals... Um, was my father-in-law. And I was talking to, we call her Nanny. Uh, I was talking to Nanny two months ago about Bud and we were just bringing him up. And she goes, you know, she knows what I do. And she's like, you know, Marcello, I wish I had 15 minutes with Bud. And I'm like, I'm like, Vicki, what are you talking about? I'm like, you were, you're, you're at Williamson Medical Center. You were with your husband and they took off the ventilator. You held his hand. She goes, no, no, you don't understand. She goes, I was with him right until he took his last breath, but you don't understand. I'm like, I don't. She's like, Marcello, I talked to you about a game changer. She's like, Marcello, we took Bud off of the ventilator. And he said, I want to, I, I want to be, I want to be cremated. And she's like, whoa, 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 what? We didn't, this is not what we talked about, Bud. And so then she's taking a step back going, okay, what else do I need to help? I, I want to be there. For, I want to make sure his wishes are fulfilled. So now he just changed the game. He wants to be cremated versus a traditional burial. What are other things that I need to pull out of him before he dies? She, she's like, all I wanted, Marcello. She was, I'd give anything. 
to spend those 15 minutes holding his hand, brushing his brow and just loving on him. But I couldn't do that because the, the game was changed for me. Here's why it is so important to understand your end of life healthcare wishes. 80% of patients who prefer, 80, sorry, 80% 80 of patients would prefer less aggressive care at the end of life. If we don't know that, that could cause them pain and discomfort. 55% of patients who indicate they want to die at home, guess where they die? They die in a hospital. My dad came from Italy, age 17. Um, and I'm saying that because this guy does not like Physicians, no offense, doctor. He doesn't like needles. He doesn't like hospitals. He, he avoids it. And so knowing that my dad does not just like to go to hospitals in general, I know that he wants to die at home. So as his son, I'm going to make sure that that happens. Also think about that. I know me personally, I, I've, I've had surgery. I've been in hospitals. Um, the beds aren't so comfortable, right? They do their best. Um, you got the overhead speaker, you got the nurse cart going up and down. It's hard to even get a good night's sleep, less spending quality time with your family at those end moments in a facility. Marcello, can we pause for a moment on that? Because I think one of the things I've learned through just my connection with Alive all these years is um, how many people do die in a hospital setting versus at home when the preference generally on the part of most patients and families and providers is that the patient in fact be at home, but when that isn't explicitly asked for or hoped for in advance, it tends not to be the case. And so many um, congregants and families that I've worked with pastorally, when they are able to have a home death experience, there is just so much um, more, the Yiddish word I'm thinking of is menschlichkeit, but like, um, I'm trying to think of like the right translation, if anyone has it, throw it out there, but it, it just feels more Hamish and warm and, and, and yes. fluffy. I don't know how to describe it, it's a terrible word, but um, it's just not as institutional and sterile. Um, yes. But, it, but oftentimes hospitals and doctors can't go that route if it hasn't been asked for in advance. No, you're, you're, you're exactly right. Yeah. The comfort of your own familiar um, surroundings, right? The favorite couch or the, or the chair or blanket or just familiar settings. Yeah, I get it. I don't, I'm, I struggle with that word too. Yeah. Well, and, and also I think um, we, as the family of loved ones who may be dying, we fear that we can't handle bringing them home or having them at home. How will we do that? Um, and that's where also educating ourselves to all the resources that are out there um, that in fact make it very easy for us to bring our loved ones home um, is important too. So anyway. Rabbi Lord, just let me put a, a word in for a second. In medicine, we say the lucky ones die at home. Mm. And, and just what you described is where hospice comes in. Right. Yes. Because they will allow you to bring a sick person home and they will be your provider 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Yeah. They really don't do that well, but hospice does it beautifully and yeah. takes the burden off the family. That's what they do. Yeah. Yes. So. Janet. My experience has been and I love a lot of hospice and other programs that are similar to that. And I've utilized them on numerous occasions, unfortunately. But, but I think people don't necessarily understand that when you are under a live hospice care and you are at home, um, Dr. Smith just referred to 24-7, well, yes, it is 24 seven, but it's not like someone from a live hospice is there 24 seven. They do come in on a regular basis and they can be on standby for call-ins, but I've been with a lot of very, very ill people during their dying days or weeks. And truly it's, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's not like someone's there constantly. And that's why I think sometimes the family 
elects to have the person go to the hospital because they can't, they don't feel that they can care for the person as much as they may need, even though they want to be home. So, you know, no, so uh, Dr. Smith and Janet, both great points. So let me, let me um, just shift gears here a little bit. So at a live hospice, each home patient has an iPad where they can, anytime they need to contact a live for questions or need help. So I'm doing this. There is 24 seven care and access, but in terms of constant people in the home 24 seven, right, that doesn't, that doesn't happen unless their symptoms get exacerbated and they have to go to one of our inpatient units, right? Until their sim symptoms become managed, then they would get the 24 seven care. But also to Dr. Smith's point, when you elect the benefit, one of the amazing things is, so for instance, Marcello gets cancer. Um, I'm gonna have a plethora of emotions and feelings about what is this disease? I know what cancer is, but how long do I have to have, you know, how long do you think I'm gonna be here? And then the family's in that same boat, but what Alive does, right, is you have a nurse that informs and educates on how to care for your loved one, gets them information about the life-threatening illness, equips them and prepares them and shows them and trains them how to care for that individual. Because just like you said, Janet, like they don't know, but that's part of our job is to inform and educate and how to keep them at home by providing not only a dedicated doctor, a nurse, a chaplain, a social worker, but educating the patient and the caregivers on how to provide that care so they can stay home. I hope that brings it full circle. Marcelo, I have a question uh, regarding the process. If a person is in the hospital and it's imminent that they have a finite number of days left, there are options, I guess, from the conversation that there's inpatient at a live hospice. And if the person in the hospital says, no, I prefer to go to my own home, can a person demand that they be moved to their own home from the hospital or are they required to remain in the hospital? Yeah, so our inpatient units, um, <clears throat> so basically it's, our, our, so there is a, there, there's, our ad admin team reviews um, individuals that need our inpatient services because we we're constantly have a long list as you can imagine. We have the Nashville and the Murfreesboro. And so depending on that individual and their symptoms, our team would, you know, bring them to a live hospice. And again, it, it's reviewed by our admin team. But our, our inpatient units are for individuals that have about four to six weeks left. And, um, you know, if there's symptoms, um, so, so you have the residential care and then you have the inpatient unit. So the residential care is for individuals that cannot stay in their home for whatever reason. And, they, and so they, they, we provide the comfort of allowing them, you know, of, of having them die at one of our inpatient units, uh, it would be like their residence. And that's about four to six weeks that someone has left to live. So that's one area that our, our uh, inpatient unit serves as residential care. Now, if they get transitioned to our inpatient units because their, their, symptoms are, their symptoms are unmanageable and exacerbated, then they would come to our inpatient unit. And once their symptoms be, are under control, then they would go back to their place of residence. Does that help? Yes. Okay. So again, there's kind of, I call it like two swim lanes. You have your residential care for someone that can't stay at home for whatever reason. And then our admin team would review uh, the scenario and um, let them know if they would be, you know, a candidate for uh, the residential care. And then an inpatient unit is also for symptoms that become exacerbated, they're managed, and then they go back to their place of residence. So it's kind of like three uh, different uh, scenarios. Could have inpatient. You could have inpatient with management and then go, go back to the home or you just go to the home and you come out to the home. Yeah, so yes, uh, well said. So we have uh, about 90%, um, you know, about 90% of our, our um, visits or our patients, we, we, we go see them at their, at their place of home, right? And then, yeah, so you, we are, our providers will go to their home or they can come to our inpatient unit, right, exactly. And typically the people, the majority, 90% uh, have a longer lifespan anticipation than the people in-house? 
I, I won't, I, I don't know, I don't, I can't say that for sure. Um, just because you're at home, it doesn't mean that you're gonna have a, 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 a longer, well, so the residential care, right? The part is for individuals that have about four, four to six weeks left to live. So that's what that's for. So right. I don't wanna say that's all the case because again, they can come in with exacerbated symptoms and then they go back home. So okay. I'm, yeah, um, good question. So also let, let's get back to your end of life care. And so th there's gonna be um, treatment options that we're gonna have to look at, right? Like Dr. Smith said, we need to really understand the risks, the benefits and the expected outcomes of one's treatment options. Treatments are awesome and they can be helpful if they relieve suffering, restore functioning and enhance the quality of life, but also they can be harmful if they cause pain or postpone dying without offering any benefit. Knowing ahead of time versus when a medical crisis arises is that this is what we need to do in advance. That's why it's called advanced care planning. None of us make good decisions. I don't care what we're deciding when we're consumed and stressed and overloaded. So your loved ones, knowing that this is, you know, the way they wanted to uh, navigate their end of life journey will give them the family members more peace and allow them to cope better. Um, having the conversation earlier rather than later so there's no misunderstanding and that so everyone is on the same page um, is really uh, you know, mitigating that familial conflict like Dr. Smith said. Uh, there, there, there are scenarios that take place all the time um, about I want mom to have aggressive treatment because I'm not ready for mom to go yet for whatever reason. And then the other side's going, no, no, I don't want mom to have aggressive treatment. I want her to die with peace, dignity, and no pain. Then you got that familial conflict that we keep hearing about, right? And, the, and they're, uh, the bigger the family, I'm not sure who said that, the more infighting. And the person in the middle is going, this is my end of life journey. This is not the footprint, how I wanted to leave my family, right? There's a saying, what we do today echoes for eternity. What does your echo look like? What does your legacy look like? What does it look like? What are the memories you're gonna leave behind? So not only about the future medical care wishes that you wanna have, but it's about the conversations and the contributions that you wanna make. These contributions are not, you know, typically, was it financial? No. What about Send, you know, providing a, uh, your love of literature to a family member that may enjoy that, you know, poems or literature or whatever, or uh, passing down recipes or telling stories about how important your faith is and what it means to you. That's the contributions we're talking about. They're not only financial, but passing down your legacy of things that matter most to you. I love this saying, what you leave behind is not what is engraved on your tombstone. It's woven... What's, but it's woven what's into the lives of others. What are we weaving into the lives of others? What does that look like when we take our last breath? So again, this can be a heavy conversation uh, depending on who you're talking with. And when we are having these conversations, we need to remember only 7% of communication is verbal. Body language, voice tone, voice inflection, those are all key indicators on how the conversation is going. So we need to be cognizant of that. Uh, I'm going to give you a, 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 an example. So if my dad, which he has completed advanced care planning, if he hadn't completed uh, the, his, his advanced care directive, this is how I would approach it with my dad. Um, he is a big Sophia Loren fan, huge. Uh, she's an Italian actress. And so if I saw something about Sophia in the news or on the internet or whatever, uh, it would give me an opportunity and go, hey, dad, you know, kind of open it up, casual conversation. Oh, by the way, I saw your girl, Sophia Loren, and he would stop, you know, he would just talk nonstop about Sophia Loren. And hey, that was kind of a close scare, you know, dad? Yeah, it was. By the way, hey, dad, we, we've never had this conversation about your advanced care planning. Would it be okay if we had the conversation? Because as your son, I want to be able to be there for you. Right, there's a little, I call it softball, right? We're not throwing hard balls in there. It's a softball approach. Um, so that is a, a way to have the conversation or if someone has an annual physical. By the way, dad, did, did your doctor talk to you about advanced care planning? Did you guys go over that or is it in place if there's a change in health status or if estate planning comes into play? Um, choose the setting 
that you're going to be most, you and that individual or individuals are going to be most comfortable in. It could be taking a walk over coffee, over dinner, whatever it may be. Or you um, can do what I just did, which was text my in-laws, which may not go over well, but I'll keep you posted. <laughs> I just asked for coffees, but I don't know if that's going to be a good call. <laughs> you guys are awesome. That, I mean, you're not missing. So subtle, me. Rabbi, so subtle. <laughs> I, I don't, she's like, I am on this present. Where is it? I need to get off the list, Mike, you know? <laughs> oh, you guys are awesome. Um, so, so sometimes uh, I, I was talking to a lady about a week and a half ago and she's like, Marcello, she came to this, one of these presentations. My husband doesn't want to engage. He, I have asked, I have asked, and he doesn't want to fill this out. She goes, guess what? He's going to get what he gets. I don't know what it looks like. I'm going to be making the calls. And so think about that lady, the burden that that puts on her. Am I doing the right thing? Am I not? That's her spouse. It, it, so when we do that, we're really doing a disservice to our loved ones because now she's burdened and stressed out of, am I doing the right thing? And she doesn't know because she loves him so much, but she wants to do the right thing. Um, so if you have somebody in your life like that, maybe you send them an email, a text going, hey, I want to have a conversation with you about this. So it's kind of preemptive. And then you have the conversation in a comfortable setting. Look, guys, talking about this sensitive conversation may reveal that you're not in agreement. That is, it's okay. It's better to know now that, hey, we, we're, not, we're not on point on all these things versus in a medical crisis. We need to be very aware. So we've got to give ourselves and that individual or individuals we're having the conversation with we need to be patient with them and ourselves, give everybody under, understanding and time to under, you know, have appreciation for the comments, for the questions. And, we, and please don't judge, we, we, we can't do that because everybody's gonna have a different view on what's right for them. Here are some just helpful questions. I kind of alluded, uh, alluded to uh, initially, but it's not about going, because um, I know my dad. Um, and if I went, dad, listen, I, I don't care. We're having the conversation today. Didn't go over well, no matter what topic we're talking about. When you, when you pinpoint someone and get them in a corner, it's not going to go well, no matter what subject it is. Hey, I'm really stressed out. You, don't, you haven't told, mm -mm, doesn't work. Hey, dad, you know, I love you. If you ever really got sick, I'd be afraid of not knowing what, what you want. How can I care for you? It worries me. We've never talked about it. I'm your son. Help me out here, right? Those, those are some questions and statements that we can ask and kind of gently approach it. Okay, so now we are going to move to the gift initiative. Uh, Rabbi Lori, thumbs up. Can you see my gift initiative? Okay. Yes. Cool. So we've got the individual forms, which are great, but I'm going to recommend that you can go download this or come by 1718 Patterson Street, go to the front desk and ask for the gift initiative booklet if you do not have advanced care planning done. And so here's what I love about what Alive offers in the gift initiative. I don't know what an advanced care plan is. Okay, here's an overview. Why is important? We talked about the age that someone needs to have it. We talked about treatment options. Are they beneficial or are they not beneficial? If they don't, you know, if there, there are certain circumstances that come into play that we've got to be aware of or sooner rather than later, who should have one? Everybody over 18. And who's going to be your voice, Janet, right? In the event, who's going to be your healthcare advocate in the event that you can't make your wishes known? I call this part of the, the booklet, what matters most to you? Your family members, your loved ones, your healthcare agent, your physician, they all need to know this, especially your hospice team, because that is the goal of the hospice team. We don't walk ahead or behind. We walk right alongside. How do you want your end of life journey to end? We want to know. We, we want to help fulfill that journey for you. So marking that down, who in your life do you want to be surrounded by? Lifestyle. Again, I talked about just because someone elects the hospice benefit, it doesn't mean they only have weeks or days to live. Um, they can enjoy hospice for months and even longer. So just because let's say Marcello has a life-threatening disease and I've elected the hospice benefit, I may want to go on a bucket list trip, Maldives. I've always wanted to go to Maldives. I'm not, you know, so 
maybe it's a, a trip you know, here locally as well. Whatever that is, again, just because you have a life-threatening illness doesn't mean you don't have goals or values or aspirations. Take that one last trip. Go see a grandchild graduate. Engage in that volunteer project that you've always been so passionate about. Whatever that looks like for you. Um, I was giving a presentation to one of the universities at the psychology department, and she was having me present this to her, her class. And she's like, Marcello, we're, I'm going to stop you. I'm like, oh, what did I say? And she's like, I want my class to know something, why this is so important. She's like, mom was dying. We were all in the room providing support and love. And she, and she indicated everybody out. I'm just the exact opposite. I'm a big baby. I want my kids right there holding my hands. I, I, <laughs> I want them right there to the last breath. And, and I'm like, well, professor, what do you, she goes, I'll tell you what we figured out. She's like, um, after mom died, we realized just kind of by her, you know, I talked about body language and how she was just kind of showing up in the room. She was anxious, afraid, and scared to die. I get it, right? She didn't want to have that lasting image of how her, right? She didn't want her kids to see that's the last image of her. So she wanted everybody out of the room. That's why when you fill this out, it's important to have a clear understanding of your physical, mental, and emotional values here. What is important to you? Do you want everyone to be around you or do you want everyone out of the room? How much control do you want in the medical decisions? Me, the doctors can handle it. I, I'm just, you know, it's okay. I'm okay with that. Do you want to die <clears throat> at home or you want to die in a facility? How important is it for you from one to 10 to be able to speak, to hear, to be aware of conversations and people in the room, to make your own decisions? We talk about, do you want aggressive treatment or don't you want aggressive treatment? Um, and then who's going to be your healthcare agent in the event that you can't make your wishes known? Speak up for you when you can't speak up for yourself. And so here is the legal form from the state of Tennessee. And you just, you just fill this out. So you're going to indicate two healthcare agents. And it's important to put two down because the first one may opt, may back out just because like they thought they could initially, or they may be out of the country, whatever reason. Um, and then when does this healthcare agent come into play? At any time or only when I don't have capacity? Now, uh, I'm just an open book. I've selected no on all these. Doesn't mean it's right or wrong. Marcello just doesn't want his family to see him in, the, in this state. So my treatment options would be no here. Um, your burial instructions. Talk to you about my father-in-law, right? That was, that was literally down to the wire. And, and um, Dr. Smith talked about, you know, there's so much familial conflict with hospice. Oh my goodness. Funeral arrangements. That There is familial, con when people are not, uh, maybe there's always, there are already some disruption with, you know, family ties, and then they're arguing over, hey, wait a minute, we want, you know, we want to have the tra traditional service. And then they're like, no, I had a conversation with, with mom, and mom indicated to me that she wanted to have a Larkspur conservation facilitate her funeral. And if you have not, if you're not familiar with Larkspur, oh my goodness, I've actually seen a, a funeral facilitated um, and there's only, I think, nine or 10 of these in the nation. It's a national preserve for natural burial only. They don't use any plastic metals, cement, chemicals. Um, it, I'm, I'm gonna, it's, it, it literally blew me away to see one of these uh, funeral services facilitated. They don't, as you can see, it's a thatched casket or a pine wood uh, box uh, and beautiful flowers. So why did I show you that? Larkspur may be an option. Um, are you an organ donor? I want to put that here. Um, so this can be either notarized or if you have two witnesses that are not related by blood marriage or adoption, that will be suffice as well. I'm going to call my mom out on this. So don't tell her if you ever meet her. Uh, picture this 77, uh, 77 year old redhead Irish spitfire lady um, that always keeps telling me what to do, even though I'm almost 49. And I said, mom, you've got your advanced care planning done. And she's like, yes. She was like all confident. I know what you do, Marcello. I've got it done. And then I paused for a second and I didn't really want to ask her this question. I said, mom, where is your advanced care planning document? And there was like, eee. 
I'm like, it's in your closet, and isn't it? She's like, yeah. I'm like, mom, I've been in your closet, and I need a roadmap just to get. But she's like, I get it, Marcello. I'm like, mom, you need to have your advanced care document so Andre, that's my brother, so we know where it is. Here's a recommendation. So your doctor's got to have it, right? Your healthcare agent should have it. Your love, your immediate family needs to have it. We recommend that you get this advanced care directive, and you, uh, we don't. I mean, it's a suggestion. You can put it in a Ziploc bag. And I'm not stuttering when I say this, put it in your freezer or your junk, uh, your, uh, junk drawer. You're never going to forget where you have it, honestly, right? There's, you, you're in and out of your freezer and your junk drawers all day long. Um, just an option. And then lastly, um, I want to show you just another unique thing about the, um, the gift initiative here. Let's say, um, you know, EMS comes up on the scene and they're digging through your personal belongings. No, oh, here's the cutout letting them know, by the way, Marcello, I have completed my advanced care plan and my doctor has a copy of it on file. So that's Marce it. Marcello, thank you so much. And I, I want to um, let everybody ask the questions that they have, but could we hold off on those just so that we can finish getting through the content, which is I want to segue since you already, um, so please keep note of your questions that you might have about advanced directive for Marcello in the form he just shared with you. Um, because Marcello brought up Larkspur con conservation, which is an incredible option uh, for burial here in Middle Tennessee. And of course we have what we think is um, a really beautiful, serene and quite lovely option for burial here at Congregation MICA as well. Um, and what I want to say as I um, turn this over to Celia is that whatever you decide for yourselves or your loved ones when it comes to being laid to rest, burial, um, whether or not it happens to be in our cemetery here at Congregation Micah, we as a congregation will support you and help to do everything we can to facilitate your wishes. And we've done that for, for so many members who have not uh, been buried on our property. So just know that even if the, our Micah Cemetery is not your choice or the choice for your loved one, we're still here to support you and help you. So Celia, go ahead and take it away. Thank you so much, Rabbi Lari. Yes, I echo those sentiments that um, we want to make this journey for you and your for your loved ones as stress-free and meaningful as possible. Um, so I, can you all see the picture of the cemetery that I put up? Yes. Okay. So this is a, be I, I find this to be a beautiful picture, especially with the sun um, streaming through the trees. Um, if you haven't had a, a chance to see the Mica Cemetery, I encourage you to do that. Um, you can drive your car right up to the gate um, at any time. You can walk through the gate as well. Um, we consider it a park-like setting. And, you know, some of, some of our staff, and I know our kids at the academy, um, enjoy this green space as they would a park. Um, and so we love this, this uh, option that we have for our members. Um, and I just have a few things to note from, from the point of view of the synagogue, so for planning. Um, <clears throat> Like Marcello said, you want to start thinking about um, how your how not only your plans go before life, but also your um, your burial or cremation. Um, you know, sometimes people are forced to make those decisions for the person who's passed away, um, and it's a lot more difficult uh, for them to to choose that if you don't know what you want. Um, and I will also say that. Um, though the conversation may be difficult now, it's a lot easier to do it now and make those um, desires known to your family or find out from your family what their desires are before the fact. And then you're done and it's so much easier to make those plans later. So, um, you know, at MICA, we have traditional burial plots in our cemetery, like you see here. And then we also have a new cremation garden that's going to hopefully be ready this summer. Um, and so a lot of uh, Jewish people, you know, traditionally it was not something that we did cremation, but now more and more people are choosing that path. And so we wanted to um, give that option to still have your ashes buried in a Jewish cemetery. And it's a, it's going to be a beautiful uh, garden, but also the, you know, the footprint is less, you're cremated and it's just a different process. So um you know, something to consider is, is just how you 
want your your remains to be put to rest. Um, you know, we will work with you, uh, whatever you decide, if you want to be buried here, if you want to be buried elsewhere. Um, uh, and so, you know, that's something that we can help you with at MICA. And I can help you and meet with you at any point to just talk through your options as well. Um, so on from our end, from the MICA end, the costs will include, you know, a burial plot, a grave opening and, and perpetual care. Um, and then also we can encourage you to make plans with a funeral home um, beforehand as well, or at least choose one, um, because a lot of people at MICA want someone that's um, familiar with uh, Jewish customs. So we can help you with those selections as well. Um, additionally, at the one year mark, um, most people choose to wait a year to do an unveiling um, of a grave marker. Um, and our cemetery is unique in that we've pretty much standardized how the grave markers look. Um, and it's a, there's, there's some selections you can make, but it's pretty standardized to have that park-like setting. Um, and so that's another thing that you can choose to do uh, is pre-select your uh, stone for uh, your grave marker. And you can see some of them here, um, but it's pretty standardized what we have in our cemetery. Um, and then lastly, and I know Rabbi Lari um, is the expert on this subject, um, but you want to start thinking about too what's important for your service. Um, some people want to have a celebration of life, like Marcello said. Some people that's important that, you know, yes, sadness is a piece of, um, of transition, but it's also um, important to celebrate the life. Some people want a more traditional Jewish service. Um, and some people just choose to have a graveside service. Um, obviously, this is this can also be determined by your family, or you can determine it for your loved one. Um, but I, I always encourage people to think about how they want that to look, so we can make sure to um, make this experience as beautiful and meaningful for your family as possible. Let me just um, a word about that, Celia, if I can, which is. Um, <laughs> Sometimes some of us feel like we won't be there. And so it's we don't really have an opinion about what happens service wise. We'll leave that to the mourners to determine. But I still encourage just as we would have the conversation with the next generation or our loved ones about advanced directive decisions that to ease the burden on your kids or your siblings or whomever will be making those decisions about a service to still have that conversation because they may say, well, gosh, mom, I'm going to want to have a sanctuary service with tons of music and and celebrate you and, and have 10 people talk about you. And and that'll give you the ch chance to say, OK, that's fine with me. And then they know or, gosh, I really don't want that. That would if I were alive, it would make me very uncomfortable. And then they'll know that, too. So, again, it's just a way to take the burden off those who will be making those decisions on your behalf, even if you feel like you don't care because you won't be there, which I hear people say all the time, but it's still helpful to have that conversation. Even if you have it with us as your clergy. Can I, can I just make one comment and uh, direct this to Marcello? Maybe something you can carry forth and carry forward. As a trained physician, we are trained to prolong life. It is very uncomfortable to have to prolong death. Very uncomfortable. Good point, Bob. Involved. Yes. Janet, yeah. you had a question? I do. I have a question, and then I also have an observation. Regarding the, uh, the cremation, mm -hmm. new cremation area, if one chooses that path, so to speak, <laughs> then would there still be an unveiling and a marker? Yes. Unveiling? ceremony option should That's one a great question yes absolutely so the way this works is um you know it is a garden and it will be a little bit more standardized but each burial set you know piece will have its it's called a niche actually um each um niche will have a great marker on top of it and it'll be granite it's about this big um and so uh that will be engraved at the one year mark so it'll all be pretty standardized what's on top, but it will absolutely have a marker. And do you purchase that niche like you would purchase 
a burial plot? Yes. And is that yes, great question. So ahead? yes, you will purchase the niche. And yeah, you can do that. So you'll purchase the niche. At, yes. And yes, you can post absolutely. Just multiple ones next to each other so that you can drag yes. those others with you. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> yes. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention that I learned in my rec most recent experience with a live hospice with m one of my very good friends who passed away in September is that you can actually, besides being able to go in and out of the residence and go back home or vice versa, you can also go in and out of the program. So you can be in, in hospice for a while and then your situation may change and you go out of hospice. And then when the time warrants it, you can go back into hospice again. And I, I wasn't aware of that previously. Yeah, Janet, that's a really good point. Um, we, we've had patients that graduate off of hospice and either they, they live a full life and then, or they just, you know, it, or they come back on service. So yeah, that, that's a really good point. Rabbi, I think you're on, you're on mute. Oh. Can somebody whistle or sing a song while we're waiting? Right, well, while the rabbi's on mute, Marcello, I want to, from my point of view, I want to personally thank you for this presentation today. The more people who hear about a live hospice, the better we like it. There is still a segment of the population completely uninformed about a live hospice. Unfortunately, there is also a segment of physicians who are absolutely uninformed about a live hospice and what it can do for people and what it can do for patients. And so the more the word is spread, the more the word gets out there, the better off the program will be. So Dr. Smith, here, I love that you said that. So here's my ask to Congregation Micah. If you know of any organization, any school, any for-profit, non-for-profit that would benefit from this, because we have an amazing uh, grief support system just for schools and, and their counselors and students. So if I can provide a presentation on our advanced care planning or our grief support or facilitate our legacy exercise to get people thinking about the legacy that they want to leave behind, please, please reach out to me. And I'll just say, sorry, that was my college age son FaceTiming me, which is why well, I was telling him we were on a Zoom and I will call him back. Um, but uh, we'll all be offering this session again. My hope is in the fall, we had a number of people who wanted to participate and weren't able to. So feel free to mention to your fellow MICA members that when we do offer this again, that it was very helpful and informative and we'd love to have them participate, so. This might be something great. I don't know if um, B'nai Brith would be interested as well. I'm just looking over at the Kerwins, um, but it could be, a, you know, this program can be offered across the community, so. Yeah, I'll, I'll look into it. Thank you. That's a good idea. Okay. What, and we what, don't even have to have the MICA specific piece as a part of it at all. So. May, may I ask what that is? I'm sorry. What is? Go ahead, Paula. Uh, B'nai Brith is a Jewish organization and we have a chapter here in town and our, um, the demographic is um, empty nesters and up. <laughs> and, and up probably from age late 50s to there are some of us in our 80s. 90s. Yeah, so we've got, we've got a, um, an audience. Okay, yeah, I would, please let me know. I'm writing that down just as a note. You remember, Rabbi, uh, your father-in-law and I did a presentation about death with dignity approximately, probably about a year and a half ago now at MICA. I think it was longer, Bob, but I do remember. Yeah, and, and done with a live hospice. Yeah, it was great. It was great. And that was well attended. And we may in the fall be able to do this as a hybrid in-person and virtual too is it would be nice in our social hall so we'll we'll have to play that by ear and see what we're able to do yeah and then i put in the um chat the booklet for everybody to have thank you 
Mm -hmm. I'd like to share something with you also is that I had a very close cousin, very, very close cousin who just passed away maybe a month uh, ago now in California, in California. And um, he, uh, he went into a live hospice uh, for the last month, I guess it was that he was uh, alive. And my, his wife, my cousin, um, when I talked to her recently, she said that she absolutely fell in love with the people that came over there. They were so wonderful and did so much good and made her feel so e at ease that she couldn't believe that they could do that. And so he passed away at and home. He, and he passed away at home. Mm. Thanks for sharing that. So. Sorry for your loss, too. Yeah. yeah. Rabbi, have you yeah. affiliated at any service or ceremony at Lake Spur? So it's funny you should say that. I'm going to throw that to Celia. Um, we had a congregant, um, not a baby, about six months ago, eight months ago, who passed away and had um, let her wishes be known that she wanted to be buried at Larkspur. Um, well, I know Des was buried. That's there. who I'm referring to. Yes, I was unable due to um, COVID exposure to attend, but Celia did. So Celia, you say something about that? It was incredible. It was, I mean, like Marcello said, it's one of the most incredible experiences I've ever had. And so um, it was, you, you, there are, there's a lot of flexibility in how it looks. Um, and I believe there you get, you have the option of doing like a GPS stone. Um, so people can actually find your, you know, find the burial area, even though there's not, it's not a traditional cemetery. It's a huge conservatory, you know, conservation area. Um, but there is a way to mark it for the, for posterity. Um, but, you know, there, like, there's fresh flowers, the, the, you know, in Dez's case, she was wrapped in a shroud and it was a, just a beautiful, um, beautiful ceremony. And um, the way they do it there is that the attendees actually participate in the burial, um, which is pretty, very Jewish. it's very Jewish. It felt a lot of the, um, a lot of the, the traditions they have there are, are very much based in Judaism, from what I understand. And, um, you know, it's dust to dust. You you participate in the burial. The the crowd kind of actually helps bury until the end and puts the, the dirt on top. And um, it's a really incredible experience. And if you haven't looked into it, I highly, I'm happy to answer any more questions offline, but. Yeah, because I, I have a ton of questions about it whether yeah. it's an in-ground burial or how it's done. Yes, it is in the ground. It's very um, natural. They can print um, picture photographs onto this uh, paper that actually breaks down into the earth and it's buried with the body. Um, you know, flowers. It's basically anything that can be completely, you know, I dusted agree. up. Factor. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. And, that's, and that's an example, Janet, where you could still have a service here in our sanctuary and have a burial there. You know, so we want to be helpful as a congregation in whatever it is your vision is. So, well, Des was the first person I had heard uh, be buried there that I knew, but I know that Becca is one of the founders, I believe, of. Yeah, she is. Yes. Yeah. And, and just to put something in, so when I first saw Larkspur, I'm a big um, timepiece a fanatic about movies. And so when I saw the movie Braveheart years ago, and when they buried his wife, it, Cecilia's going, yeah, it, it literally took, I'm like, that's Braveheart, meaning it, yeah. they wrapped her in a shroud, they had flowers, and they only go so deep in the ground too. Um, and so I immediately go, I was like, I know what this is. And so I just kind of affiliated it with the, I know, Braveheart movie, because they, how they buried them back in, in the day, so. I want to bring us back to, and I know Janet participated and Nanette, I think, did as well, and perhaps Paula or Al did in one of our recent conversations, Paula, you were at the Women's Circle, where we talked about the seven questions you'll be asked when you uh, get to heaven, Dr. Ron Wolfson's book, and one of the questions the rabbi say in the Talmud that will be asked is, did you busy yourself with procreation, which is sort of a metaphor for what kind of legacy have you left? And it just ties back into what Marcella, you said at the very beginning of this session together is, you know, the, the kind of legacy we leave is not just about um, were we honest in our business practices? Were we kind to others? Do we contribute to the world? Did we um, give philanthropically? But, um, you know, did we engage in these conversations so as to make our transition selfishly a, a, a positive and beautiful one, which it can be, 
um, out of this world, but also did we do that give that gift to um, our kids and our loved ones as well. So um, imagine that we'll get to wherever it is we're going and we'll be asked, well, did you have an advanced directive? Um, and we'll be held accountable for that. So it's something to be thinking about now. Um, as we wrap, I just want to ask if there are any other questions for either Marcello or for Celia? Any last words from either of you that, that you want to make sure we Take away. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Very, thank very you. Very thank you. Thank you so much. Thank for you time. Thanks, that was very informative. Well. Thank yeah. you so much. I appreciate my, my it. My pleasure. It was nice to meet everybody. Thank you. Pleasure Great to be with you. Thanks, you. Thanks everyone. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. See ya. Bye. Marcello, thank you so much. Oh. Oh, Rabbi Lori, I'm here. Anytime you need me, I'm more than happy to do this. Yeah, I think let's let's plan to do it again. Um, you know, early fall is what I'm thinking, but um, we'll we'll just stay in conversation about it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then I'll I'll, may, I'll maybe just touch uh, base in maybe a couple weeks. Just uh, it's called the B'nai B'rith. Did I get that right? Yeah, B'nai B'rith. So Paula is a very detail oriented. I have no doubt she will follow up about this. Um, she's just she's one of our better, you know, she's one of our more reliable volunteers and and do and doers. So don't you um, think that she won't be circling back around? But you're welcome to as well. Okay. All and right. I can connect the two of you directly. And you know that program is not a MICA program, although we have members who are part of it. But if I can be there or help facilitate, you know, in this same way, I'm happy to. Um, but we we wouldn't be specific about MICA cemetery stuff for that. Yeah. If you just want to do me a quick intro where I have her email, so I can just touch base, that would be great. Sure. Sure. I'll do it now. Okay. All, All right. right. Take care. Bye, Marty. See you. Bye, Rabbi. Bye, Marty. Maybe Marcelo. Uh, he probably doesn't know uh, what a yenter is, but. The joke is B'nai B'rith is plural for Yenta. <laughs> That's funny. So, funny. So, so Marty and Rabbi, I keep the Sabbath. So um, I'm so uh, Rachel, who, who works at Alive, um, we've talked about the Sabbath because I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. So I, from sundown to Saturday, sundown, I keep oh, the Sabbath. Oh, that works conveniently. Yeah. So, yeah. So I, when you say Shabbat, like I, I know, I, I get it. I, I keep the Sabbath. So, yeah. Cool. Shabbat Shalom, Marcelo. Thank you. Shabbat Shalom. Bye, all. Well, all right. Bye now. See ya. All right. Bye. Bye. -bye.